As I come to address the question of persecution, I'd like to start by saying that there is something seriously wrong with that brand of Christianity in this day and age that doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, that doesn't rock the boat, that doesn't make any enemies, that doesn't get into any trouble, that just gets along, that just coasts. And there are marks of New Testament Christianity that are fearfully missing in so-called ministers and ministries in this generation. We know so much of the Bible, but when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, the only question that remains is, does the Bible know us? And I've been convinced of something over these years now, and that is that if a man sets himself, but especially a church, sets themselves, decides that they are going to sell out for New Testament Christianity, they're going to get back and conform themselves back to what the Bible said was New Testament Christianity, that Satan will raise a conspiracy against them that is absolutely demonic and will open up the very gates of hell and spew out all manner of fury and slander against such and one. But God will be with them. God will be with them. And so we don't have to go looking for, for trouble. We don't have to go looking for persecution. God will see to it. Jesus Christ said, I am come to send a fire in the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? And my friend, if you ever get baptized, filled with the Spirit of God, baptized with fire, you will be a fire in the earth. And if I may, it doesn't get any better. And I found that to be the case in my own experience. It wasn't the more dignified and noble I became, but the more undignified and ignoble I became, the more trouble I got in. Just as I, as I opened my mouth for Jesus Christ, I found it the most amazing thing that just standing up for Jesus Christ, there were automatic divisions working in my family. I was being cast out of establishments. Persecution began to rise. I found the truth of that scripture where Paul said to Timothy, Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's a promise. And I found it true in my own experience. After I got right with God in 2007, the Lord began to warn me in 2008, the beginning of 2008, God gave me a word that I was going to be purged. He was going to take me to the point of death, but He wouldn't deliver me over unto death. And also gave me another very clear word that I was going to be cast out of modern Christianity. I was going to make an exit from modern, contemporary, American, megachurch Christianity. At the time, I was a leader in, in this church and a leader in, in this form of Christianity and had been for years at that point. So I just set, laid these things in my heart and meditated upon them and, and considered them. And there was no signs, no looming storm clouds on the horizon. And immediately I began to enter into a series of meetings with leaders in this church. And at the end of it all, I was given an ultimatum to be silent, and repent, or leave. And I was cast out, excommunicated on the grounds of open air preaching, on the grounds of preaching wrath, preaching hell, preaching judgment. <clears throat> and lastly, on true and false conversion, it's questioning people's salvation, questioning were, were people actually born again, because I was a hypocrite for eight years of my life, which you would hear in my testimony if you went to that part of the website, listen to the testimony there. I was a hypocrite. I was a part of the problem of American Christianity for eight years of my life until the Lord Jesus Christ graciously intervened, graciously intersected me in my life and my vain pursuits of false Christianity. God took me out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. And so I had a, a new song in my heart. I had this zeal burning in my heart to just inquire, to ask people with love in my heart, with, with grace, but to ask people, are you truly saved? Is it truly well with your soul? Do you know the biblical gospel? Because it was not being served at the church I was at. And so that was one of the first great persecutions I'd ever endured and it separated me, effect, effectively separated me from all those that I'd come to love for those previous seven years, all those that I'd come to be close to, loved ones, become, became like my own family. I was effectually separated from them in 2008, the winter of 2008. And I just went on and 
And yes, there were many persecutions from the heathen. There were death threats. There were near misses here and there. And there were <clears throat> some very terrible experiences that I, I was made to endure. But it was all by the grace of God. It was all with the grace of God. He sustained us, upheld us, taught us. And, and we learned His ways. And I'm thankful for it all. And it's only increased. It hasn't diminished. The fire's only burned brighter, hotter, larger. And I'm thankful to God for it. There are many other things in the meantime, death threats, near misses, stolen cars, etc., etc., things of this nature happening on every front with coming from the world, coming from the Gentiles. But as we just went on with God, we, we began to travel and we began to experience other forms of persecution with the law officials and being apprehended here and there and, and people threatening to stab us, to hit us. And, fights happening, be having to be defended by random strangers from the harm that was coming upon us. But as we went on, uh, we established the church in Dallas. Um, the strangest thing seemed to happen. All of a sudden the devil opened his mouth and, and spewed out a flood of waters against us. And it was directly in relationship to, to the law and, and to, to jail specifically. And for the first time in 2011, Having a wife with child, I was taken to jail and for the first time loose stare at Dallas, Texas, put in jail for four days for preaching the gospel on the streets in front of a club. And yes, there was a conspiracy. Yes, there was a, a union, an unholy, unrighteous union between the club owner and the cops. There was much evil going on and thus I was arrested, put in jail for four days and God is with me in jail and it was glorious, the best prison ministry that I've ever experienced was during those four days glory and many prisoners many many inmates were wrought upon during those days the first I experienced and then it, it seemed it appeared after that that I couldn't but open my mouth but the devil spewing out the same flood of waters against me to put me in jail and most preachers in these days they're trying to plead their first amendment right second amendment right fourth amendment all these rights that they've got if you have have become a citizen of heaven you have no rights in this world you don't have first second third fourth amendment rights you don't have constitutional rights if you are a citizen of of heaven and the devil will make sure of that and so i lost my rights effectually and began to go to jail and i've been to jail three times now for days and God has been with me and it's been glory. It's hard to even call it persecution, hard to even call it suffering or sacrifice because it's so glorious. It's, it's, it's just a blessing to be able to be there, to be able to rub shoulders with these inmates, preach the gospel to them, be right there in the midst of them for, for Christ's sake, for the gospel's sake. <clears throat> there are many things that I would say in regards to persecution, in regards to suffering, I've endured myself personally, but I don't want to be a fool in glorying. But I will glory in those things which the Lord has wrought in me and by me. I will glory in the cross of Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. I will glory in the Lord. And it's by His grace alone, it's by His mercy alone that I've endured any of those marks of New Testament Christianity that I've received any of the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ in my body. It's by the mercy of God, the sheer mercy of God in this generation that those things which Paul said approved his ministry before God approved him as a minister of God and in nothing, he said, causing offense that the ministry might not be blamed but in everything approving ourselves, the ministers of God in imprisonments. Imprisonments was one of those marks in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Most Pastor, most churches, most pastors that are looked at in these days, if they see on their background checks they're going through, they see that they've been in jail. No, absolutely not. He, this proves that he's not a minister of Jesus Christ. It's the exact opposite of the New Testament. That is exactly what they chose to be one of the marks of, of their pastors, was that they've been to prison, that they've suffered for Christ's sake. That's what the values of the New Testament church were. That was, it was suffering. They valued suffering. They valued the image of Jesus Christ being formed. And that is the image of his death. That was the highest, most, most glorious expression 
of Jesus Christ's love, of His passion, of His heart towards His people here, and that is suffering, suffering, dying for the elect's sake, suffering for their sake, that life might work in them, though death work in us. And it has, and I have been in jail three times now, and I've known what it is. My wife's been pregnant, one of those, had another child, one of those, another one on the way, one of those times. And I know what it is to be arrested. I know what it is to be apprehended by the cops right in front of my own child for preaching the gospel, not for evil. Though I suffer as an evildoer, though my picture's posted all over local media, all over, you know, the news and even national news sometimes, I'm thankful. And it's a mark against this nation's brand of Christianity that when they see it, that when all the pastors of this nation see our mugshots on the news, that they say it proves it. This proves it. he's not a minister. When that's the very thing that Paul said that, that approved him as a minister of Jesus Christ. It's a shame. It's a mockery. This Christianity, this brand of Christianity is a sham and a shame. To the name of my Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I'm ashamed of that gospel in this generation where you can be a famous rapper, have all the approval of, of the multitudes. I'm ashamed of that gospel. Christ is ashamed of that gospel. There are many other things that I would say in regards to persecution. I would point your attention to the, to the resources that we've posted under this video. And please take the time. There are many relevant sermons we have preached for years now on persecution because it's been relevant to us and because we believe that it is relevant to any true church in any generation. There is no society. There is no culture. If there is a culture that says that you can be a Christian and it's okay and we won't bother you, everything will be fine, that is not a Christian culture. That is an anti-Christian culture. And that's what we have been served in this generation and most of, of the Christians in this generation have just bought into it. They've bought into this lie that they can be Christians in this generation and there's no persecution. And I go to other nations and they say, even in America you're persecuted? And I tell them of my persecution, I tell them of the sufferings that we've endured, the afflictions that we've endured, and they say, even in America you're persecuted? Especially in America, a true Christian living with the Spirit of God indwelling them, truly living as a fire in this land, they will be persecuted, especially in this nation. Not even in this nation, especially in this nation. We've preached for years now because it has been needful, it's been relevant to us. We've needed to be strengthened, we've needed to be encouraged, we've needed God to lift up our heads in the middle of our persecution, in the middle of our trials and our afflictions. And there's coming a day, my friends, and the remnant, my friends, and conservative, open-air preaching, community, Christianity, there is a day coming where you will need your pastors to preach to you on persecution. You will need the truths that we have gleaned, that we have learned. I have learned things in these past years, specifically in these past couple of years, two, three years, that I've never seen before, that I've never known before, and how it has unlocked the New Testament before my eyes. You aren't supposed to know what it is to, to be edified, be exhorted in the way of the New Testament, except in a New Testament scenario. You can't understand what they're saying. You can't understand the depths and the, the consequences of such truth unless you're dwelling in their reality, unless you're dwelling in the glory that they were dwelling in. The New Testament scriptures were meant to edify and to exhort New Testament saints. And frankly, in America, we have not been that. But God is bringing us into it, and you will either fall or you'll stand. And I, I, I would plead with all of you to look at these resources that God has given us through the years and cause us to stand. May God give you of our oil. May God lift up your head if you're fainting, if you're suffering persecution, if you're preparing to set your hand to that plow and not look back. May God strengthen you. May God help you. May God increase His remnant all over this country, all over this world, and save them in the persecution that's coming. Because it most certainly is coming, my friends. It's coming. It's already here. It's already at our doors. True Christians in this country are already suffering. They are already being defamed, slandered, persecuted, hated, maligned,
cast out, cast off, ostracized on every side. True Christians, are you one?